Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Um, we're here today with um, two people from Maxwell Biosystems. Uh, I'll introduce them in a minute, but first I want to remind you that we have the chat. You can write all your comments and everything there. Uh, and on the bottom, we have the ask a question button. And when you're asking questions, please indicate whether you want to be on screen or not, uh, so that at the end, I know whether to invite you onto the screen. Um, Please remember that this whole session is recorded. It means you can watch it back at the end, but also means that if you're on screen, you're also recorded, um, just so that you're aware of that. Um, and with that short introduction, uh, I will quickly introduce our speakers for today. Um, so Maxwell Biosystem is the electronics and biotechnology company based in Switzerland, and they provide instrumentation and solutions to basically help neuroscientists to do their science. Um, and today, uh, they'll both tell us a little bit more about what they do. Very, very excited. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. Yes, um, so I will start, I guess. Yep, okay, so... Um, um, you have to reshare your screen. Yes, of course. All right. Okay. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so our presentation today is entitled uh, Revealing Neuronal Functions Through High Resolution Electrophysiology. So we will introduce um, this concept of high resolution electrophysiology and how it can be useful for your research in your science. Um, so first, let me introduce um, both me and my colleague. Um, so my name is Maria Bien. So I am the um, VP for Marketing and Sales at Maxwell Biosystems, and I will be talking more about our technology for today's talk. And um, here, our other speaker is um, Julio Tsorzi, uh, which is our application engineer, and he will focus more on the applications of our systems. Okay, so uh, to start with, uh, let me introduce to you first our company. So Linda already introduced uh, Maxwell Biosystems, but let me just um, show you um, more of our members and also to inform you that we are actually a, a spin-off um, company from ETH Zurich here in Switzerland. And um, our technology has been used already for um, tens of years. However, um, we just... Um, founded a company three years ago to be able to share the technology to, to, to you, to everyone. So um, our mission is basically to provide electrophysiology systems and solutions to advance scientific discovery and to accelerate the development of novel therapies for brain diseases. So our main focus is neuroscience. And our team um, is composed of um, um, engineers and also um, scientists um, who are working on both the hardware and the software for cell functional assays, as well as also having the expertise in developing the functional, the, the cell assays themselves. So we have microelectrode arrays. So um, I will discuss what these are. And um, we are using a CMOS technology for um, our devices. So um, what is our technology? Um, so on, on one side, um, electrophysiology is mostly patch clamp. Um, this is the gold standard, wherein you're able to um, have a patch pipette close to the cell and detect um, these signals that are coming from that individual cell. So these are um, action potentials or some, some ion activity. Um, on the other side, um, we have another technique that is popular, which is um, imaging, wherein you can get um, the morphology of the cells, also how they connect with each other um, through uh, microscopy. Now, our technology sits in between uh, these two technologies, um, and that's um, high-density microelectrode array. Uh, and we have products called MAX1 and MAX2, which I'll introduce later. So the reason why we say this is in between is because um, we detect um, action potential similar to patch clamp. However, because of the high resolution, we can also do some sort of imaging, electrical imaging. So this is an example. This is a single neuron, um, and this is an activity, an action potential of a single neuron. So I will play this. Um, and you see it starts from the actual initial segment and it spreads through the axons. So you can detect an action potential um, propagating along the axonal arbors. And you can see that for all of the cells in your sample that is on top of our array. Yep. So with that, you can also extract the morphology of the cell label free. You don't need to, to label them also repeatedly across multiple days. So, um, so just expanding more on what we measure. So an action potential is uh, the basic um, 
electrical activity of each of the neuron, wherein um, during the polarization, um, so this is a, a patch data. So um, if you have the patch pipette inside of the cell, so during this polarization, the sodium um, ions enter into the cell. So that's why you have this sharp peak going up. And then the going down would be the potassium um, coming out. So uh, the, the potassium ions coming out. So intracellularly, they look like this. Um, for us, we have electrodes outside, uh, which then can detect extracellularly these signals. So these are, for example, tens of millivolts, while these are around hundreds of microvolts. So that's just the difference, but the timing is the same as what you can record for um, patch clamp. Uh, but now the main difference is that not only do we have one electrode or one sensor, we have many, many of these sensors uh, that can be under each of the cell. So this means that from a single neuron, this is a Purkinje cell, um, which is actually kind of um, in a brain slice. That's why it's not directly on top of the electrodes. Um, you can then get the signals from the axons, from the soma, and from the dendrites um, just with one array. So you don't need to, to have multiple patch pipettes um, in patch clamp. So this is a high density microelectrode array technology. And uh, there are already uh, microelectrode arrays that is out there um, uh, that is available. So the usual ones are just glass uh, microelectrode arrays that are in lower solution. So usually they have larger electrodes and some larger spacing in between each other. Now um, here, um, what you can see is that uh, it can detect, let's say, the, the average of the population activity um, of many cells, but you're not able to identify the activity coming from the green cell or the red cell or the blue cell. You're just detecting them all at the same time. Also, if the cells are in between, you're not able to detect them anymore. Well, for our technology, we have many of these electrodes um, that are really tightly spaced with each other. So then uh, you can be able to identify the signals coming from the green, the blue, and the red cell. And um, there's always an electrode under each of the cells, so you're always at the right spot. And you can also access to the small signals of the cells, for example, the axonal arbors, because you also can have electrodes that are passing through that. So um, these are our products, um, MAX1 and MAX2. Uh, so max one is actually um so this is the the chip uh, i have one with me and uh, the recording unit that you see here is also very small it's like the size of your cell phone and that can go inside of the incubator so you can do your recordings inside of the incubator for cell cultures um, but you can also use it for brain slices retina and other uh, samples in vitro um, but then uh, there are some applications wherein you would like more samples recorded at the same time. So we also have MAX2, which is a multi-well system. So here it's the same sensor, uh, but it's just um, having more wells at a time that you can record. And here the mainframe is also an incubator. So uh, the temperature is controlled at the bottom and top plate. So this is the, the door that closes. And there's also gas input here. And focusing more on the technology, um, so here, um, right in the middle of uh, the, the well where you will place your sample, we have the sensor, the microelectrode array. So this is a two by four millimeter square area that consists of 26,400 electrodes in total. And the distance between each of the electrodes is 17.5 micrometers. So here you can see that for one neuron, many electrodes can detect signals from that. And that's why we are able to detect signals propagating along the axons. Another crucial thing that is um, in our technology is that we have low noise um, readouts, uh, which allows us to record these small signals. And additionally, if you're interested to stimulate your cells, any of these electrodes can also be used for electrical stimulation. Yep, uh, and of course, crucial to um, this technology is the data, um, how to record them, how to analyze them. And for that, we have our software called MaxLab Live. So it allows you to visualize the data, acquire it, organize your experiments, and also per perform the assays and also do the data analysis inside the same software. So I'm just gonna show you a few screenshots, but if you're interested, you can also contact us and then we can give you a live demo of, of the system itself online. Yes, so these are just uh, the signals coming from um, multiple electrodes. 
Um, this is the electrodes view, uh, where in the red dots are the active cells. So this is all of the 26,000 electrodes. And here is a raster plot, where in one line is basically a, a signal from one cell. And these are a 1,000 cells that you can see at the same time. And they are interconnected, and they are oscillating with each other. So you can see it like this. So um, what can this be used for? Um, so we have multi-scale electrophysiology readouts. So you can see um, single neuron um, metrics. Also, you can identify how the circuit um, is interconnected. And you can also study like local networks, for example, in brain slices and in the retina. And more on that, my colleague, um, Julio, will, will introduce to you some of these results. So Julio, I will now stop my presentation. Great. Yep, so let me just... Yes, thank you. Okay, let me share my screen. Great. Okay, so you should be able to see it now. Okay, so um, again, so the scope of uh, my part of the talk at least is to give you a broad overview of which assays can be performed with um, Max2 and uh, really also an overview of the applications these assays can be applied to. Um, but of course, I mean, since we have a lot of applications, um, these, I mean, I will not go too much into detail in any of them. So please feel free to either ask questions at the end of the Q&A uh, session or just reach out to us at the links that will pop up at the end of the talk. So um, Max2 assays, or, or let's say <laughs> the, acts, the assays that we can perform. So you have to imagine these as, um, I want to say, let's say a progressive zoom into um, your sample from the activity scan, which basically gives you an overview of the whole sample and its activity, to the network, which basically selects a subset of cells and understands how they are connected uh, with each other, and then all the way to the cellular and subcellular level with the axon tracking and electrical stimulation assay. Um, so uh, the first, <laughs> sorry for this, uh, the first assay, uh, the activity scan assay, allows us to do what we call functional imaging of our, of our, of our samples. Uh, the reason we're calling this so uh, is, I think, explained here. So what you're seeing here on the left is what, it's a simple uh, fluorescence microscopy image of primary neurons growing on top of our array. And uh, what you're seeing on the right, on the other side, is what we call an activity scan, which is simply, in this case, the um, extracellular uh, spontaneous um, activity, electrical activity of the neurons plotted in terms of their firing rate and uh, color-coded from uh, blue, uh, no activity, all the way to red, highest activity. And what is very interesting is that, first of all, it gives you a really good understanding of how the uh, culture um, organizes itself on top of the array, but and also gives you an under understanding of which cells, for instance, are more active, but as Maria was mentioning, does so in a completely label-free way. The second assay is uh, now focused on a subset of cells interconnected with each other, and it's based on uh, uh, what are called raster plots. So for those of you who might not be familiar with these, uh, Marie uh, briefly mentioned these. Uh, raster plots have on the y-axis the connected electrodes, or uh, channels in this case, which in our case correspond to the neurons we are tracking, and on the x-axis uh, time. And uh, whenever an, an event, so an action potential is detected, uh, a dot appears on the plot. And uh, when multiple neurons are synchronously active at the same time, an accumulation of dots appears and this is called a burst. Uh, burst uh, bursting activity is usually really um, correlated, strictly correlated with uh, the synaptic maturation of the culture. What you're seeing at the right side of it is uh, what we call a network activity plot, which you will see in a few slides again, which basically replicates the, um, let's say the profile of the bursting pattern. Zooming in a little bit more, uh, again, thanks to both the high resolution and the um, signal to noise ratio, so the signal quality, we can extract single uh, cells, um, both what we call electrical footprints in development in a label free way, but also understand the functionality of these neurons. Um, 
And once we are done, let's say, interrogating the spontaneous activity of these cells, we can also interact with them. So uh, what we're showing here is how you can selectively stimulate subcellular compartments of single cells. And we're showing how stimulating at the axonitial segment, which is uh, here shown with um, electrode number one, um, will then give uh, a evoke response from the cells with very low stimulating voltages, 100% of the times, but just moving approximately 10 to 20 micrometers away and stimulating on the soma uh, requires five to seven folds the stimulating voltage. And again, this is quite interesting because uh, since you know exactly where the subcellular compartments of the cells are, you can really have reproducible results. Um, and for instance, understand how the excitability of the cells um, behaves, for instance, after applying a compound. So now jumping a little, diving into the applications themselves, uh, I'm going to rapidly uh, go from to the cultures, more standard, so primary and human APC derived neurons, all the way to um, 3D structures like brain slices and organoids, and then end with retina. So how can be the first assay be used for neurons, for instance? So what you're seeing here is um, three isogenic lines from human IPCs derived motor neurons, a control line and two expression expressing two mutations which are usually related uh, with ALS. And uh, what this assay can be used for is to track in development how the culture, again, disposes itself on top of the chip and how uh, the activity changes in development. And then one can link this, uh, the results from the first assay and understand how the um, cells communicate with each other and how the bursting pattern differs in between lines. And what is quite interesting is that the way in which the burst initiates and propagates on the culture, and we can understand this again for the higher resolution, uh, is really characteristic of the specific line we are, um, we are analyzing, so for instance, in this case, for the motor neurons, you can see this small, uh, this long buildup to the burst, and then this drop of activity. And then uh, Marie <laughs> stole my video, but <laughs> I'm going to show this again. Uh, you can also um, uh, extract information about the single cells, hundreds per well, and understand how the morphology of the cells. Um, so this is what we call an electrical footprint. So the functional morphology of the cells develops and modifies over time, or for instance, after the application of a compound. But not only, you can also go and uh, understand the functionality of these cells. Like it was done here in this, I would say quite a breakthrough publication in 2013, where it was first shown that it is possible to detect um, axonal signal coming from um, from a single neurons with a microelectrode array. Then uh, fast forward seven years, what we're using this now is to detect this from multiple neurons at a time in uh, different conditions and understand how, um, for instance, a wild type and a disease model differ in terms of propagation of the signal on top of their axons. And of course, as I mentioned, you can also interact with the cells and this is what we are seeing here. On the left, uh, selectively stimulate one single cell, um, and on the right, doing the same, but in the presence of blockers. So as you can see, the stimulation of one cell in the first case actually evokes responses in the neighboring cells, whilst in the other case, it simply propagates on top of the, uh, of the axonal arborization. Now, similar uh, approaches can be used also, as I mentioned, in this case for brain slices. Uh, and very easily, one can place the sample on top of the chip and rapidly individuate the areas of interest. So in this case, CA1, CA3, and DG. And then once uh, one has this information, really track how the signal propagates in these areas. So what uh, we did here was chemically inducing a seizure and uh, the shape of the signal you're going to see has these three positive peaks, three negative peaks, which propagate, as you will see in the video, on top of the, of the slice. So we're basically following the propagation on the field potential live on top um, of the slice. 
then of course, even in slices, one can go further and uh, um, investigate even at the single cell level. And this again is due to the fact that uh, we have extremely high sensitivity with our system. So what was done here was to uh, use cerebral slices and uh, track Purkinje cells um, in culture. And this is quite interesting, I think, because uh, Purkinje cells have this very characteristic shape of the signal in the soma, so very strong negative signals, and very positive in, let's say, the fan that um, uh, corresponds to the dendrites. Uh, so in this case, you can even understand how the cell is um, orienting itself inside the slice. And based on this information, you can also perform stimulation experiments, like the following one, so stimulating in uh, this area and recording in, in this one. and uh, perform a sweep of stimulation in voltage and understand how the culture responds, uh, how the cell, sorry, responds um, to each stimulation voltage. Uh, similar approaches can be also used for organoids. So, and I think here the, the main advantage is that wherever the organoids will, organoid will fall on top of your uh, chip, you will always be able to track it both at the whole organoid level, but also focusing on the, let's say the behavior of the network uh, being formed inside the organoid, but also zoom it into single units, which I think it's quite unique. And uh, last but not least, uh, with retina, one can, uh, of course, place um, acute retina slices on top of the array, uh, detect retinal ganglion cells, and combine this with, for instance, light stimulation and detect on-off cells, uh, so cells that respond to application or absence of light, or cells that respond like it's shown here on the right, uh, or, or cells that respond to the directionality of the applied stimulus, uh, like it's shown at the bottom. So to summarize, uh, this uh, platform can be used uh, on a range of applications um, with your electrogenic cells or samples, ranging from uh, 2D cultures of primary neurons or human epsilon drive neurons, both in simple 2D structures or in scaffolds, and going from here all the way to 3D structures like organoids, um, uh, neuronal spheroids, brain slices, and retina. So I hope this was not too rushed. I know it was a broad overview, but uh, please feel free to ask questions now or to reach out to us at any of these links if you would like to know more. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very clear and interesting introduction to this technology that I honestly <laughs> wasn't very aware of. Um, and also really cool to see how like broad the spectrum is that the different uh, tissues and applications you can use it for. Um, oh, great. We have quite a few questions. Uh, so let's uh, start with the most popular one. Uh, the first question is from Sophie. Uh, she's asking, how do you culture the cells on top of the array? Are there any like special coatings that you need? Uh, so maybe I'll, I'll answer this sure, one. Yes. Uh, yes. So um, you can use, uh, let's say, all the normal coatings uh, you would be able to use uh, in cell culture techniques, so ranging from uh, PEI and lamin, PLO, PDL, uh, gel tricks, matrix. We usually, we usually have very good experience with double coatings, but we range over multiple uh, ones. We also have a protocol online. Uh, if you're interested, we can also give you the link to it. Thank you. The next question is from Varsha. Um, she's asking, um, yeah, she doesn't want to be on screen. Okay, she's asking which, uh, like, wait. Okay, uh, what like softwares, uh, analysis software methods, uh, like MATLAB, Python, R, ImageRay, uh, does the data we collect can be exported to from your system? Um, can I answer this? Yes. So um, within the software that we um, have, uh, there's already an analysis uh, that is available. But if you would like to use your own scripts or develop your own analysis tools, um, we have um, packages uh, that are suitable, for example, for MATLAB. So you can open the data in MATLAB or in Python, and then you can analyze it yourself. Um, but of course, um, it really depends on what you want to, to, to look at. And yeah, so the, the data is basically um, HDF5 format, and any it's very easy to, to, to load it in any of these tools. Thank you. 
the next question is from Anna. Um, she's asking if it's possible to do co-cultures, for example, neurons and microglia. Uh, absolutely. So uh, this I, I didn't mention, but um, of course this is possible. So for instance, uh, all the results we show we have shown with human epsis derived both motor and dopa neurons are done in co-culture with well astrocytes in this case. Uh, but of course, it is possible to to have a co-culture of cells. Thank you. The next question is from Alex. Um, he specifically wants to know if you have an analyzing tool for exonal degeneration. <laughs> no, so um, so of course um, the the measurement itself is the same. Um, basically, just following the the axonal action potential propagation. Um, but then, because you can extract the velocity, you can also see the extension of the axon and how many branches there there are. So, depending on all of these different parameters that can be measured, you can then um, try to find out whether the axon is degenerating or not. Um, whether this is a disease line or or with a compound that is added. Um, this can be detected. So yes. If I can add just one thing on this. So um, part of the data we presented with human epices derived DOPA neurons uh, actually showed this. And um, so we really observed that both the velocity in action potential propagation decreased, uh, but also the, um, the length of the connection itself appeared to be shorter. And uh, this was actually confirmed uh, by an independent researcher at the Pasteur Institute in Greece, who uh, they published uh, quite recently actually. And in this particular um, uh, disease model, this particular mutation, uh, they uh, saw morphologically what we saw electrically, which I think was a very cool result. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's, it's very nice to see that it's collaborated with other methods and approaches uh, to see <laughs> the same thing. Yep. Uh, the next question is by Yilian, if I pronounce it correctly. Um, and the question is, um, how many times can you uh, reuse the MEA, MEA chamber? Um, so now it depends what your application is. Um, of course, if it is just an acute experiment like brain slices, so you, you can reuse this, um, let's say, 10 times or even more depending on the handling. Um, but then for cell cultures, uh, what we usually uh, now recommend is just to, to always keep uh, the chip um, in, in DI water and um, in between uses. And then uh, we have, let's say, um, an expiration date for each of the chips. So you can reuse it uh, within this um, period. What is like an approximate uh, six months? Time? Yeah, I mean, you, you can also use it beyond six months as long as the handling is um, okay, but it's just that we cannot guarantee everything beyond six months. Yes, yeah, I think we all know this experience. Uh, <laughs> of other things that we use, if you take care yeah. of it well, then <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, the next question is by Yefan, and her question is um, Is it possible to link up multiple? Wait, no, wait multiple recording arrays and do inter-area comparisons or correlations? Um, can you repeat? Sorry? You mean just the results or? OK, good, yeah. I, I'm not 100% sure what she's aiming for. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, so can you repeat it again, please? I'll repeat the question. Is it possible to link up multiple recording arrays and do inter-area comparisons or correlations? Um, I mean, analysis-wise, um, if this is the, the question, uh, if it's just comparing uh, multiple, yeah, of, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but, but maybe I, I don't know if that was the, the question. So, I mean, I, I guess how I understood it, because inter-area for me sounds like brain slice. Oh, can recordings be oh. synced? Ah, In okay. time reliable, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, for Max2, because you are recording all at the same time um, the six wells, so yes, uh, that can be done. Um, for for Max1, now this really depends on um, uh, how you would start the recording. Um, but yeah, it's just that if you have multiple of the, of the Max1s together, you just need to set it up so they all start at the same time when you're recording. Thank you. Uh Thank you for clarifying, Ivan. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. The question, Thanks, yeah. the question is not answered yet. Please let us know. Um, the last question that I think we have time to cover today uh, is from Heather. 
And the question is, could you elaborate more on how you use these to image organoids? Like how deep into the 3D structure can you record? So uh, yes, approximately 100 micrometers. Uh, we have, um, Marie, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, two papers uh, showing this, and definitely one that I'm aware <laughs> of, uh, in which basically they, they show how uh, deep into a 3D structure one could record. Um, into it's um, uh, let's say for single units it's like having a, um, a flashlight kind of pointing toward a table so the more you go away from the table the more the signal spreads out so having morphology of single neurons might be more difficult uh, of course also depending on how they dispose in 3d culture but yeah to detect single units up to 100 micrometers instead of 3d structure is usually possible thank you um, with that um, we're going to finish the q a session um, like I said, I was asking in the chat if that paper that you just referenced to uh, could be shared. So let's see if we can <laughs> okay. find it later and put it in. Um, yep. I would really like to thank Julia and uh, Marie to, for presenting here today. It was a very interesting and very clear talk. Um, I hope that most of the questions were answered. If you have any other questions, uh, currently there's still the link below uh, to mm -hmm. their website. Uh, there's more contact in the chat. Just reach out to them. Ask them anything. Yep. Um, we'll be happy to answer. Yes. I mean, uh, we, we can also write here on our uh, email address. Yes. For yep, so the rest of the audience. For everyone. Yes. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, for the rest of the audience, the poster session is starting now. Uh, we'll change the link below to the poster link so that you guys uh, know where to go. And then we hope to see you all there. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoy the Bye -bye. rest of the conference. Thanks. Thanks.